Jeff Gates wrote the other day on um, in Information Clearinghouse, as yet few dare speak of its name. Instead, four-fifths of those in our Congress recently proclaimed themselves loyal to a foreign nation, Israel, and insisted that our Commander-in-Chief maintain an unbreakable bond with what the facts confirm is an enemy. In other words, four-fifths would back the US, would back Israel if Israel started sending nuclear weapons to Iran. That's the clear, that's the, you derive that. Dayan, you remember Dayan with the eye patch? Our American friends offer us money, arms and advice. We take the money, we take the arms, they sure do, and we decline the advice. That's Dayan. The fourth. Mrs. Hillary Clinton, um, Slip Willie's uh, partner. I want the Iranians to know that if I'm the president, we will attack Iran. She, this is the primaries. She said after being asked what she would do if Iran launched a nuclear attack on Israel. In the next 10 years, during which they might foolishly consider launching an attack on Israel, we would be able to totally obliterate them. Obliterate them. Look at the map and look at the size of Iran. That's Mrs. Clinton. Only 2% of the US population are Jewish and the majority are said to oppose the Zionist project, but they find their voices are stilled, stifled. I will return to Zion, a hill in Jerusalem, that's what it is, to view the scene at the end of this talk. Dr. David Kelly. Anyone interested in Dr. David Kelly? A few hands up. It's a long time actually, July 2003. But that's how they work, these lovely governments. A 59-year-old bacteriologist and our most senior germ and chemical warfare expert it is said he considered the Iraq dossier drawn up by the Joint Intelligence Committee headed by John Scarlett, now head of MI6, isn't he, Annie? Uh, former. What? He's now retired. Oh, of course he did. He was there for about a year. Sorry, I forgot that. Um, was exaggerated. The dossier, I hate that word, sexed up, but it was exaggerated. Our friend Alistair Campbell Another psychopath was responsible for that sexing up. Andrew Gilligan aired this on the Today program. The MOD insured Dr. Kelly was identified by the press, the requirement being simply to mention the candidate's name until Kelly's name came up. So it was quite deliberate. They should, in fact, they had a duty to keep his name quiet and in fact, his job for the MOD, one of his jobs, was to liaise with the press about matters of secrecy, to interpret the scientific element. It is likely that he was one of several sources for Gilligan's story, so this man's always put forward as the source, but in fact there were probably at least two, a colleague of mine reckons. There was a questioning at the Foreign Affairs Committee and an assumption that he was crushed by this. Um, I forget his name, the Labour MP uh, shouted at him. It's always repeated. Um, he was hounded by the press and belittled by Hoon, another psychopath. He went out for a walk from his home at 2 p.m. on Thursday, the 17th of July, 2003. That morning he had written over 80 emails and in one, he told a friend that he was looking forward to returning to Iraq. In fact, for the 38th time. 38th time. He had five encrypted hard drives, we are told, in his home office. He worked from home. A police search operation named Mason started half an hour before he left his house and his wife. 
work that one out. She and the daughters, one of whom was getting married shortly, reported his absence at 11 p.m. to the Thames Valley Police. The search involved a helicopter with, in, with infrared camera, and you must ask me, ask me of that later. I've forgotten to speak of it. He was found at about 8 a.m. the next morning in the wood at Harrodown Hill with, by lay searchers with a dog. Not his dog, their dog. He was dead and slumped against a tree. There were cuts on his left wrist, dried vomit from his mouth to his ears, suggesting he'd vomited lying down. He was found sitting up, or slumped sitting up. A bottle of water, part used and standing with its top on, and three blister packs of coproximol with one tablet left in his coat pocket. I have no time to list the inadequacies in investigation and judicial process or the very many omissions. Lord Hutton was appointed within 24 hours of his death whilst the body was still cooling. That is speed beyond any normal experience of Her Majesty's government. Hutton was a safe pair of hands as leading counsel at the Widger Inquiry into the massacre of unarmed Republicans on Bloody Sunday by paratroopers, British paratroopers. The coroner for Oxfordshire opened an inquest and then adjourned it for the inquiry to take place when in fact what should have happened, they should have had the inquest and then the inquiry of Hutton. I'll tell you later. There was every reason for the inquest to be completed and punctilious in such a high profile case. Lord Hutton was charged with listen to this, inquiring into the circumstances surrounding the death of Dr. David Kelly. The circumstances surrounding the death. This was to do mostly with the media and the assumption was suicide. This brief was nicely tangential to the central function of a coroner, which would be, which is, the cause of death, whether it was unnatural and whether there was foul play. It is complicated, but this was an ad hoc inquiry to which 17A was added later. In questioning, you might ask me about the Public Inquiry Act 2005, which was hurried through by a committee of nine MPs during the washout period after our lovely Mr. Blair had promulgated Parliament at that time. Hutton could not subpoena witnesses. He couldn't make them come. There was no oath and no cross-examination. It was a superb example of British treachery and of the new Labour government in particular. The verdict of this elaborate sham, this whitewash, as it was called, was 1A, hemorrhage, 1B, incised wounds to the left wrist, and two, coproximal ingestion and coronary artery atherosclerosis. I did not believe one could die of hemorrhage in this way. I understate that. A short letter was published in the Morning Star, 16th of December, 2003. I'd hesitated because I didn't want to upset the Kelly family. The key part of my little letter was as a past trauma and orthopedic surgeon, I cannot easily accept that even the deepest cut into one wrist would cause such exsanguination that death resulted. Exsanguination is loss of blood, or um, complete loss of blood, or near complete loss of blood. The two arteries are of matchstick size. That happily, that little sound bite has stuck in the press and would have quickly shut down and clotted. Furthermore, we have a man who was expert in lethal substances and who apparently chose the most uncertain method of suicide. It is in fact preposterous that he chose to die that way. In fact, it was only one artery, not the 
one you can feel easily, the ulnar artery.